Welcome to the 56th episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. Russell, we have got a lot to talk about today. We really do. Uh, I'm actually excited about this. Our good friend Craig Moore had said, hey, why don't you post pictures of that AMX 30 that we want to saw at, what, Fort Riley, Kansas? Fort Riley, yeah. We talked about that, I believe, in our 50th episode. Episode, yeah. Yeah, well, Craig was like, uh, if you got pictures, send them along. Not only are we going to add a bunch of uh, the pictures of this AMX 30, we're, we're actually going to do an episode. We're going to talk about the AMX 30 this this week. How cool is that? I know. Yeah, it'd be pretty exciting since we kind of went out of a, our way to see the one up at Fort Riley and pretty interesting. Well, if you remember, we didn't actually, we weren't opposed to actually yeah. be on that part of the, we've talked about yeah. this before, but there were, <laughs> this was a live fire range and they had Bradleys out there firing their cannons for target practice. Yes. And, uh. Yeah, uh, us two were out there going doo to doo. <laughs> we always seem to be where we're not supposed to be. I I know, <laughs> I know. They'll throw us in the brig one of these days. Yeah, it'd be terrible if they throw us in a brig. Oh man, not like we've ever done. I uh, never mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I got a email from a buddy of mine, and he uh, had told me. He says, listen, you know, I've listened to your show. I'm not a tank guy, but I know your music, you know, our, our beginning music. And he's sitting in a bus terminal and he hears our music. And he's looking around to see who's got it on their phone or their laptop. You know what this guy was listening to, listening to us on? His watch. His watch. Holy cow. Well, you know more about that. Apple watch oh, stuff. Yeah. What it, it's it's incredible. If you have one of these watches, what do you have to download it on? Oh, the podcast? Yeah. Oh, they've got a podcast app right there on the watch that you can listen to any podcast you want to. So we are at this point in our history yeah. that you can listen to our podcast on your watch. On your watch. Okay. All right. Just one of the many platforms that's out there to... Yeah, because we're on Spotify, yeah. and our number one is what, Apple? Apple. Apple it, Podcasts are our number one where we're downloaded the most. Right. So now people are listening on their watches. Yeah. As wow. my watch just vibrates to give me some breaking news. Okay. Oh, you've got one of those watches, too. <laughs> Could you listen to our podcast? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm yeah, old school. You're behind, man. You know, I was talking to my little niece and she's such a sweet thing, and, and she's starting to like tanks because you know every birthday or Christmas I give her a little tank. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she says I was listening to your podcast, and I said, "Well, that's wonderful." She was talking about technology, and I'm like, "Well, when Uncle Charlie was a little boy, he used to have to pick up the phone and turn the dials." <laughs> and she's like, well, "What do you mean turn?" You'd stick your finger in a rotir yeah, rotary, the, the rotary phone, and it yeah. would go click, 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 click. Yeah. And I said, and here's how bad it was. Where, wow. Because we lived out on the farm. Yeah. We had a party line. Do you remember those? I that was a little bit before my time. Yeah, we had <laughs> our own line by the time we. You, you were so lucky. <laughs> I've heard stories though. Because you know, imagine me yeah. at what fifteen or sixteen and. You know, you call your girlfriend, and you're sitting there talking, you know, kind of flirting. And then old Mrs. Lovell, who was a great woman, uh, long deceased by now, but she'd pick up the phone, and she'd go, Charlie, I need to call my brother in Arkansas. <laughs> I'll get right off the phone. People are like, no. Yeah. A, a telephone line that you had to share you with, shared like, your phone line, yeah. Yeah, it was true. It was true. <laughs> Now, we have one special shout-out this time. But, yeah, we got a uh, message through Gmail, and it was from uh, Eli Slater. Now, where is Eli located at, or do, you, do we know that yet? Yeah, I believe Eli said he's from Minnesota. And he wants us to do an episode on the T-72 Russian tank. And, again, yeah, we have so many tanks oh, to cover. Oh, I know. Um, that would be a pretty big one. Because, there's still I mean, some World War One uh, tanks that we need yeah. to cover. I'm telling you, we're trying to make a list now of 
of what we want to cover in the you know near future. And, and here's and, the, here's the sad thing, Russell, because of me had to make a list of tanks we've already covered because <laughs> I was working on it. I'm like, man, this is a great episode. Yeah. And, da, da, da. and he's like, it should be. You've already done it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've covered quite a few already and it's, it's getting to the point where it was hard to <laughs> remember exactly every one of them that we have covered already. But yeah, I've been making a spreadsheet to try to keep all that straight. And, and the other thing is, uh, I think it was my, uh, brother-in-law bill foster or maybe it was my sister i can't remember but one of them was like well are you are, do you have actual people listening and i'm like just on podbean we have twenty six thousand downloads yeah it's incredible uh let's just say the mouse episode did really well yeah it has it really has and we talk about podbean it's the easiest for us to get our stats off of the reason we mention it quite a bit but even like we said i mean apple you can add all the apple downloads to that too and and spotify i mean it's just just blowing our minds away of the success we've had so far we have a small niche you know we talk yes. about tanks yeah now if we talked about other military vehicles yeah we've talked about airplanes yeah. wheeled vehicles yeah. in fact talking about wheeled vehicles did you have a chance to read that south african armored vehicle yes book? i have read through that and i'll tell you what that is that is some really interesting reading oh, I, I do want to mention too I, I just want to read a little bit off the back it's the description of the book on the back and i think this little paragraph here probably i mean explains the book pretty good uh, South African Armored Vehicles, A History of Innovation and Excellence, that's the name of the book, uh, takes an in-depth look at 13 iconic South African armored vehicles. The development of each vehicle is rolled out in the form of a breakdown of, of their main features, layout and design, equipment, capabilities, variants, and service experiences. And it's illustrated by over 100 photographs and more than 20 custom-drawn color profiles. And this volume provides an exclusive and indispensable source of reference. The book is part of a series called the Africa at War series. And there's probably about 15 other books. Um, it covers anything from aircraft and just pretty much any aspects of wars. Uh, I mean, in, in Africa. I know. Post 1945, after 1945, African conflicts. Well, you know how I'm so interested in the history of Angola. And, and, and to see the tanks that they had, the battles that they were involved in, uh, a lot of heartbreak. And it, when we, again, unfortunately, every time we talk about tanks, they're involved in hurting people or killing people. We've always said we wish tanks were just built just so we can just fling on them and go, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, they are instruments of war. And I mean to tell you, this series of books... Oh, incredible. Yeah. And and this particular armored vehicle, uh, South African armored vehicle book, I mean, it covers anything from the Buffalo mine protected vehicle, the elephant variants. We did talk about that, I believe, in what, episode 18 of the podcast. Yeah. And then we talked about the Rue Cat. Yeah, the Rue Cat. And it's, it's mentioned in the book, too, the armored car. What, what episode was that? It was episode 42. See, now there's something that should give our listeners a reason to go out and buy this book. If you're going to buy it, it's from uh, Helion yeah. Publishing. Yes. Or you can get it on Amazon. But we suggest that you buy this book. Yeah. Um, Helion was super cool. They got us a book. Yeah. They sent it to us. They let Huge us read Huge shout it. out to the, the author, too. I mean, he's the one that kind of spearheaded this and got us the book. Uh, he's such a cool yeah. guy. Dr. DeWalt Venter. Thank you, Dr. Venter, for, for getting this book to us. It, it's It's got a lot of really good armored vehicle, especially South African armored vehicle information. Do, do you there. remember his, I think it was his first email to us? Or, or, or even a comment to us on Facebook. I, I'm going to give you a shocking. This is going to shock the entire audience. Charlie was saying the Rue Cat wrong. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we get over to South Africa. We're, we're, yeah. we're going to meet these South African uh, Special no. Forces guys. <laughs> They're going to just pound us. Yeah. It's bad enough when we go to Bovington, we're going to get beat up. <laughs> but yeah, just looking through this book, the pictures are just amazing. Oh, so much information. And and each vehicle they talk about, I mean, it, it's got all their stats right there. 
I mean, just yeah. incredible. It, it's just an amazing book, and we're going to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to keep it. Oh, we, wow. We yeah. were going to give it away. Yeah. Maybe we should give it away. Maybe just the inside of the United States, but I don't know. This yeah. one's very, very cool. Yeah, it is. I'm, uh, I'm impressed. You know, Craig Moore was cool enough to send us our own copies. Yeah. It, but, and one to give away. Uh, yeah. But we're going to have another giveaway. Yeah, we will here before long. It, we promise. It, yeah, because everybody's still yeah. getting barricaded. Oh, and yeah. Now the American election sort of over, maybe. Well, it's but, got a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, to our international uh, listeners, uh, shout out to Germany. They overtook uh, the UK this month as more uh, most downloads. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. So hats off to our yeah. good friends in Germany. I think that kind of pushes, yeah, for is probably the last couple months worth of downloads through Podbean. Germany actually overtook the UK, and I think the UK is in third place. So Oops. all you UK folks out there, you need to... Get your buddies to listen. Yeah, spread the word. Heck yeah. I, I still say that half of them are waiting at the airport for, with cricket bats, <laughs> waiting for us to show up for killing the English language. We don't talk English. We talk America. Yeah. America. We talk hillbilly. Hillbilly. But we're going to have to do an episode with like old man vo- voices. <laughs> I remember back yeah. in the day when the Sherman could penetrate things. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's get started on the episode. The French AMX-30 main battle tank. Russ, give us some history. The French AMX-30 main battle tank was designed at the same time as the German Leopard. The AMX-30 was France's attempt to provide its armored forces with a potent second-generation main battle tank and the first French medium tank built since the late 1950s. The AMX-30 was a radical step forward of previous designs like the AMX 50 slash 100. According to the doctrine which dictated the initial requirements, the technology advances in ammunition rendered all standard protections obsolete. Therefore, providing the adequate protection would have seriously hampered the mobility of any tank model. Instead, it was chosen to improve mobility and firepower, the protection being active, helped by a smaller and lower profile and speed, making it a harder target to hit. Uh, again, tank design at the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Leopard, not known for its armor. AMX-30 is not known for its armor. Uh, these guys had basically like the American Hellcat type thing. Good gun, mo- mobility. Yeah, mobility. And, and to be able to knock out enemy tanks. Yeah, the faster the better. And, you know. uh, wh- whatever the Soviets had, yep. what, the T-62 back yeah. then and... You yep. know, I, I hate to say it, with the Leopard's guns and the same X-30's gun, a- able to knock out some Soviet tanks. Yeah. You know, that was the whole Cold War era. And, and you know, with all the stuff that was going on in the world and the Berlin Wall and East and West Germany, they were positive that the Soviets were coming across and were going to invade. So these tanks had to be quick, get out there and hit hard and yeah. then run back. Wow. Yeah, I'd like to be able to tell you what AMX stands for, but I'll guarantee you that I would butcher it since I do not speak uh, any French. You know. The Atelier de Construction Moulinol. Uh, yeah. We're killing no, it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Now we're going to have French people waiting at the I airport know, when we show up to go to their museum. Everybody's going to kick our rear ends to. Uh, we apologize to the people of France for our, our hillbilly education. That's why we call education. it AMX. Yeah. So from now on, we are just going to refer to this as the AMX. And it was uh, developed under the direction of General Joseph Molini, and he was actually charged with the project. Under head engineer Heisler supervision, the first prototype was completed in September of 1960 and tested afterward. The second was unveiled in July of 1961 and tested a new rangefinder and tracks. Both had a well-sloped hull and hemispheric turret reminiscent of the Soviet models and SOFM petrol engines. No less than seven other t- prototypes would test a sleeker cast turret design until 1963. So they're taking their time. Yeah. They're building them. They're sending them out in the field. They're testing them. And they're like, oh, we don't like these tracks. Or, oh, we need a rangefinder. You know, 
They've got so, plenty of time, in other words, to develop these. And, They're not in a hurry to... And make it right. Yeah, and make it right. Despite the decision of the goal to leave NATO and opposition by West German Defense Minister Franz Strauss, and comparative trials were nevertheless held at French camps under the supervision of several NATO members, and between five prototypes of each country from August to October 1963. The results were confidential, however probably decisive in the decision of several of these countries to adopt the Leopard. I hate to say it. The Germans know how to make tanks. I know. You know. They really do. Uh, the French prototypes were light, only comparable to the Swiss Panzer 61, and very low, which was equal to the T-55. The turret design was conventional, the rejection of the oscillating design being dictated by NBC and Fording tests, skirt and turret ring weaknesses, and shot trap effect. The first two prototypes had a 720 horsepower SOFAM 12 GSD. Oh my god, what the fuck that is. The first two prototypes had a 720 horsepower SOFAM petrol engine. The later were equipped with a multi fuel Hispano Sousa diesel, according to the new NATO standard. The two last prototypes were delivered in November 1965 as pre production vehicles with several modifications, including the whole turret cast, different gun mantlets, and later on the whole line of prototypes was redesignated the AMX 30A, and the production tanks were designated the AMX 30B. As built in June 1966, the production AMX 30B had a part cast, part welded hole with a pronounced front slope, which ended with a rounded beak. The sides were also sloped, and the rear engine deck was elevated, like on the Leopard. The turret was fully cast and had an oval hemispheric shape, and the tank had a combat weight of about 36 metric tons, or 40 short tons. For this weight, the protection was as follows. 50 millimeters, or 2 inches, at the thickest of the armor, and it was sloped at 70 degrees. The front plate was sloped at 70 degrees, and the sides were sloped at about 23 degrees. In direct fire, the equivalents were 79 millimeters, or 3.1 inches for the front armor, and 59 millimeters, or 2.3 inches for the hole or forward sides, and 30 millimeters, or 1.2 inches for the rear sides and rear plate armor. The whole top and bottom was about 15 millimeters, or 0.59 inches thick. The turret front was about 80.8 millimeters, or 3.18 inches thick. The AMX-30 was the most lightly protected of any main battle tank in Europe for the time. The design philosophy indeed favored entirely active protection given by the speed, agility, and small dimensions. The amphibious ceiling and MBC lining were completed by a slight overpressure and ventilation system. I think the Sherman had better armor than this thing. Yeah, yeah, the way it- You know, if you guys have been listening, you know, you might have got it lost in there. There's not a lot of armor. No, no, it's it's not real thick for... But they went with, you know, speed yeah. and the gun. What kind of gun did this thing have? The unique feature of the MX-30 was its monoblock steel 105 millimeter or 4.1 inch F1 cannon, which shot the Obus G shell. It combined an outer shell and a suspended inner shell divided by ball bearings, allowing the outer shell to spin while the inner one remained stationary. It was unlike fin-stabilized heat rounds of the day and more accurate, and this independently of the range. This particular shell had a practical range of about 3,000 meters or 3,300 yards, and the 780-gram hexalite-filled warhead was capable of defeating 400 millimeters of armor equivalent, or 16 inches of armor at this range. There's a good point. There's what they're talking about. They're like, okay... Anything that we shoot at is going to have to have at least 16 inches to stop us. The only tank I know that had more than 16 inches was, what, the mouse? Yeah, yeah. Had, what, 22 inches in the front? So, uh, yeah, they're looking for speed. Uh, They're looking for a great gun, and it looks like they had a great gun. What else did they have on that? The gun was fitted with a 38-centimeter recoil brake and had a 40-centimeter course and and minus 8 plus 30 depression and elevation. It could also fire the OCC F1 M60 high explosive projectile and also a smoke round. A total of 50 rounds were in store inside the tank. 
some ready in the turret, others in the hole. And there was also a coaxial 12.7 millimeter or 0.5 inch M2 Browning machine gun in the mantlet. And a 7.62 millimeter or 0.3 inch anti-aircraft machine gun on the turret roof. Respectively with 748 and 2080 rounds in store in the tank. Now that's some machine gun power there, buddy. It is, yeah. You know, they're talking about anti-aircraft gun, but... Yeah. yeah, that could be a very effective anti-personnel. Oh, well, sure it could, yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the gun. Tell us a little bit about the mobility. The power plant was the Hispano Sousa HS-110 diesel engine, multi-fuel. It was a 28.8 liter or 1,760 cubic inches in capacity, which produced 680 to 720 horsepower. Nice. For a power to weight ratio of about 20 horsepower per ton. That's good. Not bad at all. And it shouldn't be too bad for a, you know. A quick tank. A high mobile, yeah, high mobility tank. Mm -hmm. That's what they were designing it. (laughs) Faster than. Yeah, exactly. Faster than Tiger. (laughs) This engine could be replaced in the field in about 45 minutes and was able to give a 600 kilometer range or 370 miles. Thanks to a 970 liter or 260 U.S. gallon fuel tank capacity. So, 370 miles uh, on a tank of gas, which is 260. That's not bad. It's about like a little compact car. Yeah. I mean, today, I mean, it's, yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. The top speed of the production AMX 30B was 65 kilometers per hour or 40 miles per hour. And good performances for the day, although not outstanding, 63 kilometers per hour for a Leopard 1. So, so it, it's, it's yeah. even a little quicker. A little quicker. Um, than the Leopard. Good gun. I, I don't have a problem with this tank uh, yet. Yeah. So far, so good. The engine was served by a Gravina GHB 200C twin plate centrifugal clutch coupled to an AMX5 SD with five forward gears and five reverse gears. <laughs> I'm not going to do the French reverse gear joke. Holy moly. <laughs> French people are going to yeah. beat us up. We want to keep our listeners not uh, in, in France. <laughs> Run them away. We're kidding. We have <laughs> utmost respect for our French oh, friends. Sweet. And these were largely inspired by the German Panther gearbox. However, this demanding gearbox was the source of many problems and was replaced in later production models. The drivetrain comprised rear adjustable drive sprockets, front idlers, five double reinforced aluminum road wheels with rubber tires, and five rubberized return rollers per side. The suspensions were relatively complicated, counting torsion arms for each doubled road wheels and shock absorbers. There were two bogies with independent torsion arms per side and one independent set at the rear. Shock absorbers and dampers were placed at the front and rear. The steel tracks with rubber shoes were about 570 millimeters or 22 inches wide. And on tr- on trials, the AMX-30 showed it could ford 1.3 meters to 2 meters, or about 4 to 6 foot deep water obstacles with fast preparation, and up to 4 meters or 13 feet with a full preparation which includes sealing the air louvers with blanking plates, installing the snorkel tube, and the infrared driving equipment and searchlight. Okay, so I'm six foot. So without prep or a little prep, they can do six foot of water. Yeah. But if they put on the snorkel and everything and they need to get over a river like uh, Bridges Blown or something, they go under water 13 to 13 feet? feet deep yeah good lord that, that's and, and not they, bad they kick on their infrared yeah you know the spotlight yeah. underneath good lord oh, man know. that's yeah. cool that yeah, is i'd like to see that in operation to with the little snorkel tube coming out the- <laughs> oh that'd be so cool um tell us a little bit about the you know like the production and the evolution Production took place at a factory in southeastern France near Lyon. This industrial facility set up in 1952 had already some experience in producing 1900 AMX 13s. You know what? Let's do an episode on the AMX 13. Okay. Okay. So in the next, what, couple of weeks? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. This is where the final assembly took place from suppliers, which were responsible for the power plant. Armored hole and the turret, main gun, 
uh, machine guns, and the optics. The initial order was for 300 vehicles, later 900 by 1971, subdivided into eight batches, plus extra chassis for the variants. By 1966, the manufacturing rate was about 10 tanks a month, and then reached 20, and then 10 again in 1969. The last deliveries of this original order ceased in 1975, with the B2 variant production was launched again, culminating to 1,171 vehicles in 1985. By 1989, the very last tanks were built for export to Cyprus, while 166 B2 variants had been delivered and 493 more converted for a total of 1,355 accepted in French service. They're behind this vehicle. Yeah. They've, they've designed it. They properly tested it. They did all the prototypes. And now they're kicking them all out the line. Even, what, 20 a month that we were talking yeah, about? Yeah, That's pretty good production oh, it is, yeah. for a post-war France. Yeah, I mean, we're talking Cold War era. Yeah. At this point, yeah. You know, and, and putting this all together, mm -hmm. I am I like this tank. You know, you've talked about some of the variants, and you know what? It's time for you to crack a book. We could tell you about the variants, but we want you to open a book, research this yourself, and look at some of the AMX 30B or 30s variants. They're very cool, and it's something that you want to learn about. Yeah. I mean, anything from howitzers to rocket launchers and, I mean, you name it, they it, they put it on this chassis. And it, we're going to post pictures of the AMX-30, but and it's a very cool-looking tank. It is. I was very impressed, I know, when I, you know, when I seen it, yes. Uh, the first thing I remember when I walked up to that AMX-30, I was like, well, hello, sexy. Yeah. It, it, it is a sexy-looking tank. In my book, it's almost like what a tank's supposed to look like. Look like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The AMX 30B did not come without uh, some issues and limitations. Uh, had some pretty serious issues, actually. The major one was the transmission, which development dated back from 1938. It needed good training and careful handling, proved difficult to maintain, and was reputed unre unreliable. So we were talking about the. Five speeds in reverse. Apparently, that's a problem. It must have been. Hey, yeah. do you you know how many reverse gears a Japanese uh, World War II Japanese tank had? Uh -uh, I don't. Uh, nobody knows. They all charged forward. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. All right. I like to apologize right now. <laughs> to anybody that was offended by that, uh, it was just a joke. For example, the driver had to manually change gears at specific times. And this was especially difficult when moving over rough terrain. This proved also a break for export until this issue was solved in the 1980s. The protection was not improved since 1965 and barely compensated by the top speed. Late 1970s tanks like the American M1 Abrams or the Soviet T-80, both turbine propelled, were much faster while having a far better protection. Comparatively, the Leopard 1 also lightly armored at the beginning, was up-armored in later versions, almost doubling its protection value. To have another clue of its battlefield survivability, 10 countries operated this model, and only one retained these tanks in active service versus 30-plus for the Leopard 1, many of which still retain them frontline, like Greece. It was considered at risks against the T-62 and the T-72. Cold War. 1960s, stuff like that. The Soviets re released the T-80. We have the M1 a Abrams with the re reactive armor. Okay. These are turbine. So now they have great speed, excellent guns, and great armor. This is kind of killing that whole no armor, great gun yeah, battle plan. Exactly. So we were talking about that at the time. They're making these tanks. They're exporting them. Tell us a little bit about the exports. One of the first customers of the AMX-30 would have been Israel, which already bought gun packages and AMX-13s, but the negotiation failed when the British government eventually agreed to let Israel build under license the Chieftain in 1966. 
Both Belgium and the Netherlands declined the type, choosing the Leopard 1 instead. However, the AMX-30 was exported to many less affluent countries. You know, we can't go into details, but you might want to research why Germany couldn't sell certain countries their tanks, but the AMX or the French could. Yeah. That's an interesting story, but... few restrictions that Germany was placed under, apparently, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> let's not get into that. Yeah. If you want to know, you need to research it. Yes. Some of the countries that did receive the AMX-30 was Bosnia. Uh, the local army received 32 AMX-30s, which were secondhand from Saudi Arabia in the 1990s after the war. Chile received 46 tanks. Uh, due to growing tensions with Argentina, Chile placed an order for 46 tanks, but the delivery was cut short to 21 when the French government applied its veto. Cyprus uh, received several tanks. By the early 1990s, Greek AMX-30s were phased out and 90 transferred to the Cypriot National Guard. 12 more were obtained later, as well as 52 B2 variants in the early 2000s. And they are still front line today. Well, that's awesome. Hey, yeah. Hey. Use what you got. It's exactly right. What you can afford and what you got. Yep. Uh, we were talking about, like, uh, we did the episode on the M3 Stewart. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, what, Argentina still has it with yeah. a 90 millimeter gun. Yeah. So, you know what? They built it. That's they it. built it yeah. well. That's it. Probably shouldn't have put a 1938 transmission in. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, Qatar um, was another country that purchased several AMX-30s. By a 1977 agreement, 24 AMX-30Bs were purchased, and then 30 B2 variants in 1987. The re replacement by the Leopard 2 is underway now. Saudi Arabia was another country that had several that they obtained through the Palmier contract in 1973, Saudi Arabia acquired 190 AMX-30s, acquired 190 AMX-30Ss. The S versions were simplified and adapted for desert combat. Later, one under the same contract, 59 MX-30Ds, 12 Ps, and 51 SPGs were obtained. And in 1979, the 52 SPAG versions and 50 of the AMX-30C versions. Why do I so, think... So, wow, that, they, they, they bought several of the variants. I mean... Uh, uh, why do I think that when they named the AMX-30S to be sent to Saudi Arabia, that meant sand? Now, uh, I, know, I know Spain got some. Yeah, Spain had several, too. They can Spain considered purchasing or producing locally the Leopard 1, but due to the ban on 105mm L7 gun from Britain... And then proposal from France to allow building the AMX-30 under license. A deal was concluded in 1970 for 19 tanks and provisions for a local assembly of 180 more. All right. Yeah. Okay. So they, they made some of their own. Yeah. Tunisia was also involved in uh, acquiring an unknown number of ex-Saudi AMX-30Ss in the 1990s. Yeah, Venezuela in 1972, this country placed an order for 142 and then reduced to 82 AMX-30Vs and 4 AMX-30Ds. And today their actual status is unknown. There's a lot of trouble yeah, going on in Venezuela. Of, exactly, yeah. A lot of conflict down there. And, and, and again, we're not... They may have had to have sold them or something to... Uh, again, we're not trying yeah. to get into the politics or anything. Uh, we wish the Venezuela people, we actually have listeners down there, believe it or not. Best of luck to them. Well, Russ... You know, we've been talking about this. Let's get into some of the combat. You know, uh, did the AMX-30 see any big wars or anything like that? Well, now that you mention that, yeah. Um, the AMX-30B2s were actually seen some combat in the in the Gulf War of 1991. No way. Yeah. Oh, you got to tell us about that. The French participation in the Gulf War, codenamed Operation Daguette, saw the deployment of the 6th Light Armored Division, referred to for the duration of the conflict as the Division Daguette. Most of its armored components was provided by the AMX-10 RCs of the Cavalry Reconnaissance Regiments, 
but a heavy armored unit, the 4th Dragoon Regiment, was also sent to the region with a complement of 44 AMX 30B2s. Wow. So the French are like, okay, we're going to send some guys and yeah. we're going to protect our guys. Heck yeah. So they sent 44 of them. All right. Cool. Tell us more. Experimentally, a new regimental organizational structure was used with three squadrons of 13 tanks, a command tank, and six reserve vehicles instead of this then normal strength of 52 units. Also, six older AMX 30Bs were deployed fitted with Soviet mine rollers provided by Germany from the East German stocks and named the AMX-30 Demim. The vehicles were all manned by professional crews without conscripts. The Dagut division was positioned to the west of coalition forces to protect the right flank of the U.S. 108th Airborne Corps. This disposition gave the French commander greater autonomy and also lessened the likelihood of encountering Iraqi T-72s, which were superior both to the AMX-10RCs and the AMX-30B2s. With the beginning of the ground offensive of February 24, 1991, French forces moved to attack its first target, Objective Rocombo, that was defended by a brigade from the Iraqi 45th Infantry Division. A raid by Gazelle helicopters paved the way for an attack by the 4th Regiment Dragoons, demoralized by heavy coalition bombardments, the Iraqi defenders rapidly surrendered. The following day, the 4th Dragoons moved on to their next objective, Chambered, where they reported destroying 10 tanks, 3 BMPs, 15 trucks, and 5 mortars with assistance of U.S. Air Force A-10s and capturing numerous prisoners. Let's see. There we go again. We have to do a episode... On the A-10 war. Oh, board. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, here it's... It's not a. It's not an armored tank, but I'll tell you what. It, it sort of is. Yeah. It's got, you know, all sorts of guns yeah, and rockets, yeah. and it's made to... Tank killer. You know, uh, if you go to Whiteman Air Force Base uh, in Missouri, I think it's Knob Nostra, Missouri, yeah. they actually have some National Guard... A-10s up there. Yeah, yeah, they do. But painted on the sides, you know how they like to paint stuff? Yeah. Painted on the sides, and one of their decals is a warthog with a tank in its teeth. Oh, yeah. You're sitting there shaking oh, it. Oh, man. So, you know, and it says tank killers. Oh, wow. So, you know, I hate to say it, we're, yeah. we're just going to do an episode on that. I'm ready for the uh, virus to be done. Hopefully, they'll start up their air shows here before long and get back up there and See a pretty good air show. And just kind of some background on the AMX 30B2s. They were announced to be produced and built in about June of 1979. It's an essentially an AMX 30 with an integrated fire control system based on a laser rangefinder and an LLL TV system, a new transmission, and several other improvements, including suspension. MBC system and gun stabilization. So they finally fixed the transmission. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that was the only flaw that they really complained about. Pretty much, yeah. So by, yeah. what, 1979? Yeah. They had it fixed. Made some pretty good improvements on it, so. So that's why that tank's still in service today. Yeah. Wow, okay. Now, we've talked a little bit about the French AMX 30s in the Iraq War or the Gulf War. The Gulf War, yeah. And I know Qatar uh, had the AMX-30s like you, we were talking about. Tell me about how they used it. Because Qatar was a, a, an ally. Yes. And I know they saw action. Yeah. In fact, I remember a little bit that they ran across some like T-55s. Yeah. The Qatari AMX-30 saw combat during the Gulf War at the Battle of Kofji, where on January 30th, 1991, they counterattacked in an attempt to retake the city of Kofji from Iraqi forces, which had occupied it the night before. During the action, Qatari AMX-30s knocked out three Iraqi T-55s and captured four more. At least one Qatari AMX-30 was lost during the battle. The Qatar uh, AMXs are moving in. The T-55s are set up. They fire, knock out one of the AMXs. 
and then the AMXs just set three on fire, and the other four crews just jump up and say, nope, nope, yep, they're done. We're, we're done. We're done. We, we got our one. And just kind of a little history on, or an update on where Qatar is and their AMX 30Bs. And as of 2019, they've still got 30 units in service alongside about 32 Leopard tanks. So Yeah, you know. So, hey. Like I said, yeah, if it works. It does, yeah. You know. What do we always say? You use what you got. Exactly. And I know uh, a lot of our listeners are going to go, are you serious? You want us to crack a book and research it? Guess what? We're going to give you homework. Exactly. And, and it's going to be worth it. Yes. When you see the AMX-30 variant yeah. that has the nuclear missile launcher. Oh, wow. Incredible. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, yeah. you're, want, you want to research this tank. The good thing is about most tank books, too. Even if you're not real good at reading, the pictures are always cool to look at. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you know what? If you want to skip to wiki or whatever, you know, these keyboard oh, treadhead oh, wannabes um, use to look at pictures. Yeah. But another place to see really cool pictures of the AMX is that, uh, what, what does Craig write for again? The military encyclopedia? Oh, the tank dot com. Yeah. Yeah, we want to give them oh, a shout man, out. Man, I'll tell you what, they've got so much information on just about any tank you can imagine out there, and, and they and keep it up to date. That's what's nice. And their artwork is yes. just amazing. So again, get out there and check out that website. If you don't want to crack a book, we'll let you, you know, tic tac <laughs> on the keyboards. But be to be honest, you do learn a lot more by reading. Yeah, you really do. You you feel more connected to the exactly. history. Exactly. And when you learn about this tank, it's variants, and yes. like I said, you, you look at the even the artillery piece that they used on the AMX 30 frame. That's cool looking. Yes, I'm telling is. you guys, you want to do, do I some know. research. I know. Like we've always said, we want people to buy these books, to we get do. connected yes, with yes. the history. Exactly. And me and Russ are so touched yes. that our younger listeners – you know, uh, like Eli yeah. and, and Jacob and, and yeah. so many others. We're getting some really neat messages from some of the younger listeners. I mean, from, anywhere from 10 to 14 years old. It's just, it's impressive. I I, I really like this. this. This makes it all worthwhile and, and getting these younger folks involved in. Because these are the new. vehicles. These are the new historians. Yes. And someday when Eli or Riley or Jacob or, uh, or even Razbaz, you know, all these guys that are young guys yeah. getting into it, they're going to write books oh, yeah. and they're yeah. going to research. Yeah, they'll get to that point. And, you know, maybe they'll make TV someday, yeah. you know. and I, I truly wish that I would have been as interested in tanks and armored vehicles when I was much younger. And yeah. Instead of, you know, towards the middle or... <laughs> yeah, he, he, end of my life like now. I mean, hey, this so much more I could have done. And oh, absolutely, man. But one of these kids will be on TV and oh, they'll yeah. say, "Where did you get your start in tanks?" Well, there was these two old <laughs> hillbillies <laughs> out of southeast Kansas with a podcast. <laughs> two tankers and a cat of all things, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of which, where is the cat? Oh, I think she's wore out. She was asleep under the covers in there earlier on the bed, so I don't know. So, she seems to be sleeping more. I think she's getting older. <laughs> Aren't we all? So, or just a typical cat and sleeps a bunch. But I want to point out that, yes, Russ has a very nice bed, and he's got a beautiful quilt, and the cat is tucked into the Oh, bed, yeah. You know, you look at the. She'll sleep under the covers. I, it, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But <laughs> she thinks she's human. I guess so. You know. It, all right. Fine. The cat's out there uh, dreaming right now uh, of tanks. Man. <laughs> she she eats better than I do. Oh, she sleeps better than man. I do. She's got it made. Her and her two new friends that she moved in with here. So. Yep. In, in our new studio. Oh man. I mean to tell you, people. Yeah. Uh, Russ has got our studio looking really good. Yeah. We need to send some pic add some pictures yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. We are going to do our Patreon shouts shout outs now. We want to shout out to uh, Kim Eric Shire. Now, I don't know if it's Kim 
and her husband Eric, Eric or or, or yeah. it's a Kim's name. I'll have to message him and see for sure. Uh, Kim, if you're listening, we apologize. Yeah, we do. Yeah, you know, and I, we are familiar with Kim. Um, she did send us a a donation through PayPal here, or he, or she, or he. Yeah, you know what? We'll figure it out. I, I'll, I, I'll message him through patreon this and episode I, i've ticked off the french <laughs> I, i've ticked off the japanese i uh, oh never mind oh well uh who else do we have we've still got riley um he's been with us now for a couple months excellent yeah um what what is jacob's last name azaki i can never I, I can never say it and then we got michael Kolb? Kolb, yeah. Yeah, we're, I, I probably messed that up. We've got Raz Bad. All right, Raz. And Evan. Hey, Evan. Thanks for sticking out with us. No doubt. And who else do we got? Still got our Antonio Bernarda. High five, Dan. Hey, Antonio. Thank you, man. Then Slam Jamiton. All right, Slam. And then who else? Alejandro Martinez. I'm never going to say that oh, name. Oh, man, I, I know. Hey, you know, He'll actually come over here and punch me in the face. I have had a little Spanish, so I'm... Bjorn Ben, he's the man. All right, Bjorn. Thank you, man. OD, ODS Thero. Hey, man, he's been with us since, what, July 2019. Wow. Wow. Some of these has been with us from almost the start when yeah. we started up the Patreon program. And, of course, Rick Schmidt. Rick. He's our oldest, All Sydney. right, man, yep. Yeah, we love Rick. Awesome, man. Really do appreciate all you guys for the support. I mean, this is, uh, if it, you, it really is awesome. If you guys saw our new mics, oh, as you can yeah, hear, yeah, Russ was yelling at me the other day. He goes, you know, you always put in a dip of chew, because I chew tobacco. <laughs> and he says, you, the mic is actually picking it up now. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, so. If you're gonna use your spittoon, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I, I'm gonna download some little you know uh, noise <laughs> gort where it goes pating. <laughs> but yeah, um, thanks for all your support. It is going to improve the show. Um, still got plans to hopefully get a uh, transportable set up here before long to where we can do some interviews at some of these museums, and that's the plan. That's the big plan anyway. And yep. Uh, talking about museums, where's our next trip? Oh, wow. I would love for it to be sometime next year to Wyoming, to the new museum up there. That's that's the main goal, I think. And then we got to go down and see Rob. And My new job's kind of messing me over on vacation and time off, but I think, I think I'll get there. Well, you know, just because it's... I know. You know, COVID doesn't yeah. mean crime stops. Yeah. Got to remember, folks. We're, we're reti- short-staffed, kind of like a lot of police departments in the U.S. Uh, I'm a retired States police are, officer yeah. now, so uh, I play yeah. World of Tanks and do he's got podcasts. All the, he's got all the time he wants. But I'm, <laughs> and Russ is still, still two or three years left to, before <laughs> I retire. So. Russ is still running lights and siren. Oh, and, I'm telling you, it's, it's a lot different than 25 years ago when I started all this, but it's... Time I'll, be, to, I'll be glad to hang it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, the day I hung uh, up my gun and badge, you know, there's so many people in the international things, and they see everything on TV about what the police uh, are doing and stuff. Folks, man, you've gotten to know us. Yeah, we're not. Yeah. we're not like that. No, no don't believe everything the media says. Please, you know, uh, um, it's kind of like you know, people say. Well, you know, I've seen this on YouTube and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, you don't see any bad lawyers. And I'm like, what? What? I'll be honest with you. It's it's politi- it's politicized so much that it's, you know, it, yeah. politicians, yeah. you know, are there good politicians? Yeah. Are there, you know, bad probably politicians? more bad ones than there are good ones. I don't, I don't know. know. I, but, yeah. I'm still waiting for Vl- <laughs> Vladimir Putin to send us over to, yeah. you know, his country so we can look at his tanks. I want to pick out one of his tanks to bring back home. I, I'm serious. I want to take that T-14 I know. I know. and give it to Bovington. And we want to thank the French for Given, allowing the United States to have the AMX-30. To, no doubt. That, but that's, I, that's, that's, I'd like to know a little bit more about We're going to have to research yeah, that for Craig. Because... Yeah. You know what? To see exactly how we ended up with it in well, I the middle know, of Kansas. I know the AMX-30 was also used in the Iraq-Iran war. Yeah. 
Maybe we uh, captured yeah. one. Heck, very well could have been. Yeah. I, I don't know, folks. Yeah, we'll we'll, but, yeah. we'll we'll research it. Try to figure out exactly where that came from. And, what a great. Or if anybody out there has research on the AMX thirty on the Fort Riley Military Base in in Kansas, I mean, give us a give us a email, email or something, or call us. Call us, yeah. I keep for, give us a voicemail. Yeah. Go to our website at www.twotankers.com. And there's directions right there on the front page on how you can leave a voicemail for us. And we'll play that on a future episode. And yeah, we welcome that. Hey, maybe we can get one of our young listeners to yeah. give it a call and hey. just leave us a voicemail. Yeah. yeah. What a great episode. But I would like to see that pick up a little bit and people leaving us a message. and So we can play yeah, it on air. Play it on the air and get them there. And Excellent. Cool. Well, like I said, what a great episode. Yes. So I guess we're going to just have to close it out. Yep. This is Charlie. And this is Russell. As always, happy tanking and have a great week. <laughs>